Welcome back to our final episode. We have seen that the first three decades of American rule in the Philippines can be neatly divided up into three phases. The first 12 years was a period of social engineering where America attempted to provide stability and unify the country through a common language, democracy, and a free market system. A strong sense of racial superiority pervaded American colonial officials' perspective. Rudyard Kipling directed his 1899 poem, White Man's Burden, to America as he encouraged America to serve as a civilizing force in the Philippines. The overt racial tones of that poem resonated with most early American officials. Some of the lines in that poem included, Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Francis Burton Harrison's eight-year tenure as Governor General for the Woodrow Wilson administration captured the years from 1912 to 1920. We saw how Harrison did provide greater authority to Filipino politicians, but he did this at the expense of not fulfilling his own duties. A few Filipino politicians gained inordinate influence while Harrison spent his days pursuing physical pleasures. The third phase of America's colonial experiment in the Philippines, like the second, lasted for eight years from 1920 to 1928. While Leonard Wood proved to be a much more conscientious and effective governor general during these years, his inability to work with Filipino politicians hampered his ability to provide a path forward. Following the unexpected death of Woodrow Wilson, President Coolidge had to choose a new governor general who could combine the professional collegiality of Harrison with the work ethic of Leonard Wood. He found this person in Henry Stimson. Between 1901 and 1935, there were 16 American governor generals, including one who later became a U.S. president and Supreme Court judge, Taft, the first cousin of a U.S. president, Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., a man who barely lost the nomination for a successful Republican presidential contest, Leonard Wood, and a famous tennis player whose name still graces a major tournament, Dwight Davis. But of all these officials, Henry L. Stimson was the most distinguished. He served in the cabinet of four presidents as either Secretary of War or Secretary of State. As Secretary of War during World War II, he told the newly sworn-in President Harry Truman about the secret production of the atomic bomb. One biographer notes, quote, Stimson was almost alone in having responsibility for every stage in the atomic bomb project, from the theoretical research that made it possible to the operational decision to drop it on a certain target on a particular day. Stimson was born on September 21, 1867 in Manhattan, New York, to a wealthy family and a father who was one of the city's leading surgeons. At the age of eight, Henry and his six-year-old sister Candace lost their mother to a kidney illness. In his state of abject grief, Stimson's father sent him to the Phillips Academy, an elite boarding school in Andover, Massachusetts. Stimson excelled there and went on to earn an undergraduate degree at Yale and then a law degree from Harvard, after which he promptly moved back to Manhattan, where he joined a firm headed by Elihu Root, one of the primary architects of America's foreign expansion. Stimson concurred with and praised Root's imperial vision, and by 1895 he had become a partner in one of Wall Street's most influential and prestigious law firms, Root, Clark, and Stimson. 
Though not keenly interested in politics, Stimson acquiesced to the pressure placed on him by the New York Republican Party machine and ran for the state governor in 1910. As expected, he lost the election but was rewarded for his efforts by being named President Taft's Secretary of War in 1911. His portfolio included the Bureau of Insular Affairs, which administered the Philippines. In 1926, Stimson and his wife, Mabel, accepted an invitation from his close friend, Leonard Wood, to come to the Philippines, as Wood needed advice as to how to break his stalemate with the Filipino politicians. Here is something to note about Stimson. He was professional to the core. He did not abide laziness or the objectification of women through jokes or comments. It was said that Stimson made up his mind about someone often from first encounters. So it was that his first meeting with John Early led to one of the most unlikely of deep friendships. Leonard Wood brought the Stimpsons up to the mountain province to meet Early and visit the various Igoro tribes. Stimson so enjoyed his time with Early that he asked him to journey with him back down to Manila. On the evening of Thursday, August 12, 1926, Stimson and Early dined together at Manila's Malacanang Palace. Stimson's diary notes that the conversation went late into the evening. The primary topic was the welfare of the Igorots and Early's two-year tenure as the province's interim governor. Early detailed the demonstrable progress over the past two years in Mountain Province and explained that his interim status was due to the Senate's ongoing battle with Wood. Stimson noted in his diary, met with Governor Early at dinner at Palace and had long talk over conditions in Mountain Province. Fine, upstanding American. And so when Stimson returned as Governor General two years later, he chose Early to be one of his three primary confidants even while Early remained as the Igorot's governor. Stimson worked well with Quezon, Osmeña, and the other Filipino politicians and made major changes in the relationship between his office and Quezon. For example, Leonard Wood would never meet with a Filipino politician alone. He always wanted a witness. But Stimson was not that way. He was famous for saying, the only way to make a man trustworthy is to trust him. When he addressed the National Assembly and the Senate, he addressed them as my fellow countrymen. And his wife Mabel opened the governor's palace to the public. Despite reaching out to the Filipino leaders, Stimson still seemed quite distant with just about everyone. Perhaps it is because Stimson's formative years took place at the very formal Phillips Academy, Yale, and Harvard. He also had a somewhat innate reserved personality, and all of this made him appear to many to be cold and aloof. Early in his political career, critics picked up on this, and a journalist reported after his 1910 loss of the New York governor election, quote, his cultured accent, his uneasy platform presence, his cold personality, almost every detail of his manner, gave his electorate an impression of a young aristocrat who condescends to rule and who, though he may be a good ruler, condescends. The opposition press called him the human icicle. Even Quezon, who claimed that Stimson was the Philippines' most effective governor general, did not develop a close friendship with him like he had with Harrison. But Stimson's relationship with Early defied his normal remoteness. Walter Robb, who was arguably the most influential American journalist in Manila during the American colonial period, put it best, Stimson cultivated a coldness toward men, 
but to John Early, he utterly melted. The friendship between the two men seemed unlikely. Stimson was the scion of a family whose Ipswich, Massachusetts-based roots began with George Stimson arriving in the colony around 1636. Henry's father occupied a prominent social position as an accomplished surgeon in Manhattan. Early's parents, on the other hand, were 19th century Irish immigrants, his father a disgraced, bankrupt brick maker. Stimson attended America's finest schools, joined Manhattan's top law firm, and quickly became a partner. He was also quite wealthy. In 1903, at the age of 36, he bought 100 acres in West Hills on Long Island, where he built a distinguished summer home. On the other hand, Early graduated from the Washington Agricultural College, an institution that was so new when he attended it that its future was in doubt. His only chance to own property was a homestead covered by sagebrush and bereft of water. But there were deeper aspects to Stimson and Early that cemented their friendship. Both men were around eight years old when their mothers died. Neither had children, and they were intolerant of immoral conduct. Throughout their careers, numerous reports appear where they reprimand employees for making disparaging comments about women or boasting about sexual exploits. They were straight-laced, not given to promiscuity or excessive alcohol. Finally, Stimson and Early were professional to the core. Their prodigious reports are characterized by detail and thoroughness. The Earlies and Stimsons spent Christmas and New Year's together and were in each other's homes often. Early brought Stimson into the Ifugao territory to meet with the more remote Igorots and to show him the remarkable terraces in Banawi. In his diary, Stimson remarked about Early's proficiency in communicating with the Igorots and their overt respect and affection for their governor. Also, the one repeated request that Early made to Stimson was the need for policies to protect the forests of Mountain Province. He was almost a century ahead of his time in terms of anticipating a deforestation of the mountains. During the first week of January 1929, the Stimsons were in Baguio visiting the Earlies. Stimson noted in his diary that much of the days were spent on walks with Early, but both of them had a secret that they were keeping from each other. Perhaps they didn't share their secrets because they wanted to cherish the time they had because it soon was going to come to an end. There were letters that Early received during the fall from friends where they told him about rumors that Stimson was going to name Early as the new vice governor of the Philippines. One of his friends wrote to him, quote, another, another news item brought by the mail is that John Early is the next vice governor, end quote. Their relationship had grown that close, but now both of them had a secret about how their time together was going to end. Stimson's secret was going to get out in a few weeks, but there's no indication that he told Early about it. In November of 1928, Herbert Hoover won the U.S. presidential election and was in need of expertise on foreign affairs. China was embroiled in a civil war with the growing popularity of Mao Zedong and the communists. In Europe, the Nazi party won 12 seats in the Reichstag. But of greater concern was Japan's increasing expansion in Manchuria and their expanding military capability. It was within this global context that Hoover decided to bring Stimson back from the Pil Philippines and make him his Secretary of State. As for Early's secret, we're not exactly sure when he learned about it. There could have been stomach pains or bleeding, but he knew something was wrong. He grew more tired during his long hikes, and that was not like him. He met with doctors 
and all of them came to the same conclusion. It was a case of advanced colon cancer. Early must have wondered how after all he had undergone that at the height of his career when he was doing the most good after suffering through a difficult childhood an ignominious firing by Worcester he now had to die. By February 1929 both secrets were out although Early kept it only to himself, his wife, and to Stimson. Stimson met with Early and told him not to despair about his diagnosis as he had been keeping up with the latest advances in medicine and there was a new cure for colon cancer. We might remember that Stimson fa Stimson's father was a prominent doctor in New York City, so he did continue to read about changes in the medical field. In the United States, Physicians at the Kral Clinic in Cleveland were publishing papers that claimed they had found treatments that could cure even the most advanced cancers. Stimson insisted that John and Willa join he and Mabel on their voyage to San Francisco and that he would pay for all of John's treatment. On March 21, 1929, the President Pierce docked in San Francisco and journalists flocked to get pictures of Early and Stimson. Stimson made a public statement about Early saying that John Early is the best governor in the Philippines today. Many newspapers picked up on this. For example, the Oakland Tribune had a story noting that, quote, there are persistent rumors that Early is going to Washington to meet Hoover as a probable successor to Stimson. But Early was in a visibly weak condition and had to go immediately to a hospital in San Francisco. He and Willa took a train to Cleveland where Early was admitted to the Kral Clinic. The supposed miracle for cancer was radiation. The procedure was to do surgery and remove all the visible evidence of cancer and then to go through at least two regimens of radiation treatment. So. In 1929, the myth arose that radiation was a cure-all for cancer, and it was not until the early 1930s that a reassessment of radiation treatment tempered earlier hopes. Doctors learned that radiation did not eliminate metastasized cancer, and that one effect of radiation was that it could actually produce cancer in some patients. As Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee explained in his book, The Emperor of All Maladies, quote, quote, the complex intersection of radiation with cancer, cancer curing at times, cancer causing at others, dampened the initial enthusiasm of cancer scientists. Radiation was a powerful invisible knife, but still a knife, and a knife, no matter how deft or penetrating, could only reach so far in the battle against cancer. Early had kept his diagnosis and surgery a secret, but when it got out, his friends in the Philippines immediately wrote to him. Bishop Mosher wrote, Your illness just known. Entire mission distressed and pray for your recovery. Mrs. Mosher and I send love and sympathy to you both. From Bontok, Someone wrote to Willa and noted, The people of Bontok, young and old philosophers, have been very anxious about governor's state condition when we learned he was in the hospital there. From Hilary Clapp, who he kept from being sent to be exhibited, and as we see in this picture, moved from a loin, loin cloth to a suit, becoming one of the first Igorot medical doctors, he wrote to Early, Please let me have the consolation and satisfaction of expressing in words and on a piece of paper my thoughts. All the Igorots feel we have something binding in common with you, and we instinctively think of you, talk about you, and murmur words of prayer for you. Please feel that you have so many friends in the mountain province who are worshiping you. One of their stops while Early was in recovery from his surgery was in Butte, Montana, where Willa visited her parents. 
journalists came to the house to interview early. Despite the reporter's prov provocative and leading questions, early maintained even-handed responses about life among the Highlanders. He explained that Igorot society, rule of law, and dress were as morally correct as those in the U.S. Rather than a group of tribes hungry for blood and head-taking, he presented the Igorots as peoples defined by generosity. He also mentioned his fluency in various Highland dialects. He was quoted as saying, the people are of an old established race, and one of their many outstanding characteristics is hospitality to people from other countries. They may have peculiar costumes, but their ways of living are just as correct for them as the costumes are for the Americans. When asked whether the U.S. should give the Philippines independence immediately, Early refused to give a response. The article did not mention Early's health, describing him as tall and alert in action, and his reason for being in the U.S. was official business. At the end of the article, however, Early hinted that he had his mortality in mind. Quote, Early has nothing but high praise for the people over whom he rules, and he said, It is very likely, if all fares well, that we will spend the remainder of our lives on the islands. Early had beaten the odds his entire life, and though the surgery and radiation brought him to the brink of death, he was able to recover and was pronounced cured. But in his weakened condition, Early knew that he probably could not hike up and down the Cordillera Mountains. Still, Early was insistent on returning to the Philippines. There are a few documents that claim Early did not have job prospects in the United States and had no financial resources to live on, and so he had to return to the Philippines. But it is clear in letters from Stimson that the Secretary of State would find work for Early in the U.S. if he wanted to remain. But Early was determined to go back to the Philippines. The person that came to the rescue of the whole situation was Dwight Davis, who was the new Governor General of the Philippines. While at Harvard, Davis won numerous amateur tennis tournaments, and the Davis Cup that amateurs still compete for is named after him. Like Stimson, Davis was a man of integrity and much loved by Filipinos. When he traveled to the Philippines to take the position of governor general, he brought his two adult daughters with him, and they made an enormous favorable impression on the Filipinos. They opened up the governor's palace to everyone and spent much of their time with the poor and disenfranchised rather than attending parties with the wealthy. Given that Early's condition was severely weakened by cancer, Davis wondered if it might be possible that he would have sufficient strength to serve as a special advisor to the governor general. That came with a substantial salary increase and minimum hiking into the Cordillera Mountains. Davis wrote to Stimson that he was well aware of Stimson's, quote, very high opinion of Early, which is confirmed by everything I hear, hear, hear. Stimson thought it was a great idea, but only if Early believed that he was strong enough to take on this task. He wrote to Early about the offer, and he enthusiastically accepted it and made plans for he and Willa to return to the Philippines. The Earlies arrived back in the Philippines on January of 1930 after having spent eight months in America. On Early's first day back in the Philippines, January 31, 1930, he typed the hardest message of his life to Davis. Sir, on account of my physical condition, not permitting me to make the trips of inspection required for the proper performance of my duties as governor of the mountain province, I feel constrained to tender my resignation from that position very respectfully J.C. Early. Davis responded that he had no choice but to accept Early's resignation. 
with these words. Under the circumstances stated, I cannot do otherwise than accept your resignation, but I do so with regret, having been informed of the efficiency and tact with which you have performed the duties of that position and of the satisfaction of the people of that province with your administration. The following day, Davis offered early the position of advisor with an annual salary of 12,000 pesos or $6,000, a very generous compensation. As a te teacher in 1906, he had an annual salary of $1,200, and even his salary of $4,250 as governor was considerably less than that as aide to the governor general. Remember, this is the time of the Great Depression. He accepted Davis's offer, and despite his health issues, he hit the ground running, undertaking three extensive tours of the southern Philippines before making his way back to Mountain Province. From the 1st of February to the end of May, he spent just three weeks in Manila. During his time in Mindanao, Early ascertained how the indigenous peoples were faring there. He wrote long reports about how that the large Japanese population in Mindanao was flourishing while the poor indigenous peoples were being neglected by their political officials. He suggested that the best land be taken away from the government and given to the poor farmers. After three trips to Mindanao, Early wrote in his report, quote, Unless the government becomes more effective, unless a Filipino farmer obtains the same care and direction as the Japanese, he is beaten before he starts, end quote. In his first year of working with Davis, the long-tenured vice governor of the Philippines gave notice that he was going to resign to return to the U.S., and eventually he became the president of the University of Iowa. Uh, his name was Eugene Allen Gilmore. Davis cabled President Hoover and insisted that Early be given the position of vice governor, noting that he was one of the few Americans who had universal admiration by both Filipino politicians and American colonial officials. Many letters were sent in to Hoover from prominent citizens that were recommendations for Early's appointment. But Hoover wanted to give the position as a favor to various politicians and decided against Early. Still, the fact that Early was on the verge of being a heartbeat away from becoming governor of the Philippines must have seemed surreal to the son of a bankrupt Irish brickmaker. He had come so far in his life. As the 1930 summer rainy season gave way to the clear, cooler days of fall in Baguio, Early turned his attention to something that reminded him of his mortality. Bishop Mosher, along with numerous others, had requested that he give the keynote address at a dedication service for Charles Henry Brent and Leonard Wood. The service was to be held at Manila's Cathedral Church of St. Mary and St. John and would include the unveiling of two stained glass windows honoring Brent and Wood. The service commenced at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, November 9, 1930. Brent and Wood had graced the covers of Time magazine and had profoundly affected the Philippines. Wood died in 1927, Brent in 1929. Wood was certainly a controversial controversial figure, but even Brent was criticized for being either too close or too far from the Roman Catholic Church. Memorializing these men was a tall task to give a man who knew that he himself was close to death as his cancer seemed to continue to grow. But Early saw this as one of his greatest honors. The service began with a responsive prayer, a recitation of the Apostles' Creed, and a congregational hymn for all the saints. Early then came to the front, stood behind the pulpit, and delivered the address 
entitled Gentlemen Adventurers. He began with the remembrance of Wood, emphasizing his accomplished work in the medical field. He scarcely mentioned his role as governor general, perhaps a tacit acknowledgement that Wood lacked basic diplomatic skills that would have made his tenure more successful. When speaking about Brent, early lauded the bishop's campaign against opium addiction and businesses that profited from exploiting people. The theme woven throughout the address was how Brent and Wood loved their fellow humans. At a time when there was little said about men who loved deeply, Early publicly called these men lovers of others. As he drew his address to cl a close, Early said, In generations to come, when time has etched away the false from the true, may we expect chants of praise on Leonard Wood to rise from the lowlands to meet answering chants and praise of Charles Henry Brent rolling down from the hills of Luzon. The author of Justice will gradually draw back the veil and let the names of these great humanitarians shine among these immortal men who gave much because they loved much, who served humanity to the utmost. During 1931, Early's health worsened, and during the summer of that year he collapsed and had an excruciating surgery that almost took his life. As word got out about his worsening condition, he began receiving letters from friends. One of them was from an American professor at a distinguished university in the Central Islands called Siliman, who had known Early when he lived there as a school administrator. He wrote to Early, I do not know just what to say about the condition of your health as it is now and then reported. I hope it has been over-exaggerated. If not, you know you both have our deepest sympathies. I do not want to wait until it is too late to tell you how much I have always admired you. I cannot begin to set down what is in my heart to say, but consider it all said and more, too, and just remember always our friendship as we remember yours. It is probable that the last public speech Early made was in celebration of Memorial Day 1931 at the American military base of John Hay in Baguio City. In it, he addressed the growing cynicism and demythologizing of historical figures. He contended that historical context provided a helpful lens when judging the past, saying in his speech, quote, by disregarding the time environment and refusing to recognize the fact that every time has its own manners, they picture Washington a drunkard, Jefferson a wastrel, Hamilton a stock jobber, Lincoln a foul-mouthed jester, and Grant a crook. In this last speech, Early anticipated how post-colonial scholars would overlook any good that may have come about from outside rule and benevolent assistance. They were not perfect, Early noted, but many had sacrificed to stop the Highlanders from perpetual warfare, advanced literacy throughout Mont Mountain Province, and introduced modern medicine that saved the lives of Igorot women and children. By December, Early was in hospice-type care, but he spent that Christmas in Baguio, and on December 31st, he submitted his annual report to the Governor General, who was in Baguio. On the first day of 1932, Early attended an evening celebration of the New Year, but then he smiled and dismissed himself before the meal was over. He went up to his room, and surrounded by his wife and other friends and officials, he passed away at 6 a.m. the next morning. He was buried on January 4th, just two days after his death, in the Baguio Municipal Cemetery. 
It was reported that when Early was confirmed as governor of Mountain Province at the start of Stimson's tenure as governor general, the Bontok elders said, We want Governor Early to be our governor always, but we realize this cannot be. Therefore, when Governor Early dies, we want him to be buried here so that his bones can rest with our bones and his spirit can always remain with our spirits. John Early's story was lost to history for many reasons. One is that his story revealed the exploitation of the Igorots by people like Hale and Worcester. Another more practical reason is that he had no children and all of his papers were kept by Willa, who lived until 1971. She never remarried. The story I was told was that she died in a rundown hotel room in New York City and his papers were found under his bed and donated to the University of Michigan, where I stumbled onto them. So this brings our course to a close. We began by looking at the United States' earliest interaction with China and Japan. We learned about America's experimentation as a colonial ruler in the Philippines, and we saw this through the lens of one America's forgotten hero, John Early. I hope that you've enjoyed our journey.